Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? Last week I was talking about letters and uh, Dragonite Spam left a comment saying I feel like every CS channel inevitably takes a sideways turn into linguistics whenever they spend a certain critical amount of time on string handling and I'm 100% here for it. Well, excellent! See, <laughs> the reason linguistics is such a big deal is uh, computers are only really interesting at the points where they intersect with human reality. Algorithms and logic and, you know, apps, games, search engines, sure, under the hood they are streams of ones and zeros bouncing around at unimaginable speeds, but that stuff is completely meaningless until it gets turned back into something that we human beings can engage with, something that we can understand. And maybe that's turning electricity into coloured light and lighting up the pixels on your screen to create images and videos like, uh, hey, this one right here. Or maybe it's turning electricity into sound. Hello. Or maybe it's turning electricity into movement. Uh, any of you folks out there, you fly drones or you've got a self-driving car. Yeah. But the oldest and the most widespread way that we bridge that gap between the digital world of information technology and the analog world of human biology is text turning ones and zeros into letters and words that have meaning for us, and vice versa. And a huge part of making technology inclusive and accessible is thinking about the languages and alphabets and writing systems that human beings are going to use to interact with it. So over the next couple of videos, we're going to dive into some of the gnarly details of how all that stuff actually works. And we're going to start in the United States of America sometime in the 1960s. Now, digital computers have just got to the point where they are powerful enough that people are thinking about hooking them up to electric typewriters so they can communicate with them using keyboards and printouts instead of entering binary code directly using toggle switches and then reading the result on banks of blinking lights. And so all kinds of folks are working on systems for translating printed text into binary and back again. IBM has already got there. They have launched their System 360 mainframe in 1964. It's using a proprietary encoding system called EBSIDIC, Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange Code, which I always thought should be EBCADIC because binary coded is not binary soded. But we're not going to talk about that in this video, other than to acknowledge that it exists. It's older than ASCII, and if you really want to, you can go to IBM right now and you can give them about $100,000 and they will sell you a Z95 mainframe that still speaks EBCADIC. Now, at this point in history, there has been a global telegraph network for about a hundred years. International Morse code is well established as the standard way of encoding text to transmit across a network. And at a glance, you might think Morse code is a binary system because it's dots and dashes, right? Well, no. Morse code is actually a time-based encoding system. The code for A is but if you leave a gap, then that's the code for E followed by the code for T. So really, Morse code is a trinary system. Every data point in a Morse code message is either a dot, a dash, or a space. And the, the dits and dars within a single letter, those are separated by one space. There are three spaces between letters and seven spaces between words. So Morse code is kind of a non-starter, and for all kinds of reasons, folks don't want to embrace EBCADIC, EBCADIC uh, as a standard. And so the American Standards Association, which would later change its name to the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, you've probably heard of them, they set out to design a binary encoding system for text. They called their solution the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII. Now, there's a few folks still out there who have been coding longer than ASCII has been around. But for the vast majority of people working in tech, ASCII is just something that's kind of always been part of how computers work. And the idea that anybody actually designed it might come as a bit of a shock. But ASCII is actually full of things that I think are really clever. So if it's okay with you folks, we are going to go on a little guided tour of the ASCII character set and we're going to learn a little bit more about how ASCII actually works. First of all, 
ASCII is a 7-bit code. The idea of 8-bit bytes, that was well established when ASCII was first published, but the designers kind of deliberately chose to only use 7 bits, partly because they thought having a spare bit might prove useful in future, and yep, they were absolutely right. But partly also because in written English in the United States of America in the 1960s, there weren't that many more characters that they had to worry about. ASCII's 7-bit encoding, which means we've got 2 to the 7 equals 128 characters to learn about. And those characters, they're usually grouped into four blocks. Now, there are two things you need to remember about ASCII. First, it was designed to work with mechanical teleprinters. And second, it was designed to be stored on punch cards and paper tape. And Though it's probably decades since anybody actually used a card punch or a teletype machine, ASCII was so successful that making any changes to it turned out to be practically impossible. So here's the first block of ASCII characters. Now, you've probably worked with some of these. Anybody who's worked with C will recognize null. That's a byte full of zeros. And in C and in C++, null means end of string. So if you're reading a bunch of ASCII characters from a memory stream or a file input and you see a byte full of zeros, that means you're done. Which means that in C-based languages, the standard way of reading and copying strings is you start at the beginning, you rip through the bytes one at a time as fast as you can until you see null, boom, and then you stop. It's simple, it's fast, it's easy to implement. Sure, if your code doesn't stop when it gets to null, you are gonna end up reading memory you are not supposed to. But don't worry about it. It'll only take a couple of decades before the operating system people figure out a way to stop that from happening. Next up, there's a bunch of codes that you might think haven't been used for decades, but that's not entirely true. See, those early teletype machines, they also introduced another convention that we still use today, the control key. If you wanted to send control code 1, which was start of heading, SOH, you'd hold down control and you'd press A. For code 2, it was control B. And so to send end of text, which basically meant stop, stop, stop printing stuff, it's all gone horribly wrong, you'd press control C. And so next time you've accidentally put an infinite loop in one of your programs and you crash out of it by hitting control C, you're actually using a control code from the 1960s that was designed to interrupt a mechanical teleprinter. Now, the next two codes, they've also kind of fallen out of favor, but control G, the bell code, that's another one that still works. Back in the 60s, this was the code that told your mechanical teleprinter to literally ring a bell. And half a century later, if you open a Windows terminal and you type echo control G. And while you're there, try pressing control H. <laughs> it's useful to know that in case your backspace key ever stops working. All right, now we get to the fun block. Those mechanical teleprinters we talked about, they printed on a continuous roll of paper and they had a physical print head called a carriage, which moved left and right across the paper. And there were a bunch of movable metal brackets that you could clamp into position at various points across the page. At data that was printed in columns, it was known as tabular data. The process of arranging data into columns was called tabulation. And those metal brackets that were used to line up the columns, they were tabulation stops, which was very quickly shortened to tab stops. So ASCII code 9, which we still use today, when you press the tab key in VS Code, you're inserting an ASCII code 9 into your document. That code meant move the carriage across the page until it hits the next metal tab stop. Now, ASCII also has a vertical tab, which crops up in some unlikely places. If any of you folks out there uses Microsoft PowerPoint, uh, you probably know that if you press Shift Enter inside a text box in PowerPoint, PowerPoint <laughs> you get a line break that doesn't start a new paragraph. And if you copy the contents of that text box and you paste them into something like VS Code, you'll see that those soft line breaks, those are actually ASCII vertical tab characters. Now, line breaks are one of the great controversies of the internet age. If you're writing ASCII text and you want to start a new line, what do you do? Well, on the early teletype machines, the carriage return and the line feed, what we tend to see today as, as backslash R and backslash N, they actually did different things. Uh, teleprinters didn't have fonts, they didn't have styles, but they could 
kind of print bold text. You could use a carriage return to move back to the start of the current line, and then you could print the same line again, and it wouldn't line up exactly so you'd get this kind of bold effect. Or if you needed to redact something, you could overprint it with XXXXX using the same trick. Now it turns out you can still use that same trick today. This is really handy if you're building a console application and you want to display a progress bar. Um, each time you need to update progress, what you can do is you can print a raw carriage return character to the console. And instead of giving you a new line, it'll take you back to the beginning of the current line. And then the next thing you write will replace whatever is already there. Now, as I'm sure most of you folks are painfully aware, text files on Linux and macOS, they use a single new line character to indicate a new line, a single line feed. Uh, but Windows uses a carriage return and a line feed. And the reason for the difference, this goes way back to the earliest days of ASCII. There was an operating system called Multics. It was a predecessor to Unix, and Multics was one of the first systems to use device drivers. Um, the operating system, it didn't talk to the keyboard or the teletype machine directly. There was an abstraction layer. So in Multics, it was trivial to say, hey, when you see a line feed in the output, that actually means do a carriage return and then a line feed. So you move to the start of the next line. And Unix was built on top, or was based on Multics, and then Linux was based on Unix, and Mac OS or OS X, that was based on the next operating system, which was also a dialect of Unix. Windows, on the other hand, Windows 11 had to be backwards compatible with Windows 10, or nobody would use it. And Windows 10 had to be compatible with Windows 8, and Windows 7, and Windows Vista, and Windows XP, and Windows 2000, all the way back to Windows 95, which was built on top of MS-DOS, and MS-DOS was based on a much older operating system called CPM, and CPM was built to work with the same teletypes and terminals as the old mini computers, which didn't have this concept of a device driver. They just sent streams of raw bytes from the OS to your input-output devices. Uh, if you're wondering, by the way, Apple Macs used to use just a single carriage return, no line feed, as a line break. Uh, that changed in 2001 when Apple released OS X. In the last 20 odd years, I've only found one application that still uses a standalone carriage return as a line break, Adobe After Effects. Now, the rest of the ASCII control block is just a kind of graveyard of things that were very important back in the 60s, and today nobody really remembers what they were for. The thing they have in common is they're all non-printing characters. If you open an ASCII text file in Vim or in VS Code, you probably won't see these characters on the screen, so we tend to just ignore them. But they're part of the ASCII standard, which means they are probably never going to go away. The next block, that starts with the blank space, and it includes most of the punctuation characters supported by ASCII. Now, I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons ASCII used a seven-bit encoding was that they didn't really need that many characters. But here's where we see one of the compromises that uh, the designers of ASCII had to make. Because printed books and typography, they've used distinct opening and closing quote marks for literally centuries. And so when the creators of ASCII, they were looking at the frequency of printed characters American English, they'd have found distinct characters for open quotes and close quotes, single quotes, double quotes, but they decided that was unnecessary. And so all we got in ASCII was a single quote character and a double quote character. And also this character here. Now in standard English typesetting, there are four completely different punctuation marks. There's a hyphen, there's a minus sign, there's an N dash, and there's an M dash, and they all mean different things. But you know, same deal, the creators of ASCII, they looked at this and they went, no, we don't need all of that. Now, for a long while, nobody really cared. People who used computers for typesetting, they were using specialist software like LaTeX or Quark Express, and the rest of us just kind of got on with it. But within the last decade or so, there has been a massive renaissance in digital typography. More and more people are reading content directly on screen because of the popularity of tablets and ebook readers. And so we are starting to see a lot of these characters coming back in a big way. But, you know, imagine for a second what your favorite programming language would look like if ASCII had included separate characters for open quotes and close quotes, you know? Nested strings, well, they'd be a lot easier for a start. We'd be able to write JavaScript that looked like this, and parsing it, that would be a whole lot easier. Now, there are some pretty clever ideas in the next few blocks. ASCII 48 through 57, those are the decimal digits 0 through 9. And if you need to convert from an ASCII string digit into an actual number, that's easy. You just subtract 48. 
and to turn a decimal number into its ASCII representation, you add 48. But because of the way bits work, you don't actually need to add or subtract anything. To subtract 48, you just ignore the first four bits. And to turn a number back into a string, you just do a bitwise or with 0, -0 and computers are really, really fast at flipping bits like that. And so ASCII worked incredibly well for converting numeric values to strings and back again. Now, the final two blocks are mostly the letters of the alphabet. And one of the really clever things here is the difference in ASCII between uppercase and lowercase letters is always a single bit. So if you want to do a case insensitive string comparison, you just need to ignore one bit. On early mechanical keyboards, the shift key was physically wired to toggle this bit on and off, and it made doing case-insensitive string comparisons incredibly cheap and easy. Putting all the letters of the alphabet in continuous blocks, that meant we could do some quite elegant things. If you want to know whether a character is a capital letter, just check that it's between capital A and capital Z, which sounds obvious in hindsight, but uh, <laughs> Epsodic didn't get that one right. Finally, Right at the top of the pile, there is one more control code, ASCII 127, which is known as DEL, delete. Why 127? Because in binary, 127 looks like this. And in the days when data was stored by punching holes on paper tapes, if you needed to erase something, you couldn't go and fill the holes back in. All you could do was punch out the rest of the holes. And if you write an ASCII DEL character onto paper tape, that is exactly what you're doing. So there it is, the seven bit ASCII character set. The Americans looked at it and went, yeah, this is brilliant. This will do everything we ever need. And the rest of the world, well, that's what next week's video is all about. So uh, folks, tune in for that. In the meantime, I hope you all have a good week. Take it easy out there. Look after each other. I'll catch you all next time.